So thanks a lot, first of all, uh, to the organizers to, to, to invite me here and, and think that I can um, give some information regarding early career researcher. Uh, I myself is an early career researcher. Uh, as mentioned, I, I, I'm just about to finish my PhD. Within three weeks, I have defense. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but I have gone through this part of publishing, uh, expected to publish really high, do excellence in science and uh, was also served as a student president of the Max Planck Society. So I have seen all, in more, all the sectors, humanities, uh, that how students are expected to perform in terms of publication. So today I will be uh, definitely telling you something about early career researcher, but I would like to start with my own story, that what was my experience and how I get into this. And, um, uh, I just came back yesterday uh, from Zagreb. I was uh, evaluating uh, for the EU, uh, Croatian universities, uh, their PhD program, their uh, evaluation of research, how they do, and how much money they should get. And I, after seeing this library, I'm overwhelmed, but I saw one book there, which was from 1532. And just to tell you that this book has some experimental details about agriculture. So they wrote how, how they perform different kind of agriculture. And this is one of the book in the Faculty of Agriculture. This is the oldest they find in, the, in Croatia. So a form, how we communicate research in 15th, 1532 or in 14th century. And now it's digitalized. I think I'm, I feel very happy that uh, I'm, I'm born in this age where I have to, everything is connected to each other. Uh, you publish a paper and everything is automatically updated and, and get back to the paper, tells you how many people are reading your paper, how many people are tweeting your paper, and how many people are interested in your science. This is really, really overwhelming for me because I'm interested to do science, but not only for me, not to add papers to my profile or to my CV for the society, for the people, to, so that whatever I discover, it should convert, it might be converted one day to the textbook knowledge. And just to give an idea, I'm, I'm a biologist, do pure genetics and developmental biology, so uh, especially in this field, it's very, very difficult uh, to publish uh, in, a, in a high impact or excellence, what people call in the scientist. Uh, the field is going on uh, from the very beginning uh, in terms of that you have to achieve excellence only by publishing in certain journals. So I work on these beautiful fish and look at how different cells, black, silver, yellow, make stripe patterns. How they, how they communicate with each other. Very basic problem. This can be a mathematical approach, can be biology, can be genetics. But to know what is the basic system of cell-cell interactions, how, how our body is formed. And my problem starts from the very first year of my PhD when I joined the lab. And I, I, the first question was, what is my project? And my boss told me, find your, find your project by yourself. Talk to people in the lab. See what has been published. Spend some time playing around. I did that. That was a fantastic exercise and find out some papers published on such, such kind of topic, but was never able to reproduce the data. Those were incomplete, no information left, because journal says there is a limit that you can put into the papers. There's a limit of data you can put, limit of, of pictures, limit of words. And I was trying, I spent first year of my PhD being this guy because I was not able to reproduce the data, and the previous student did the same experiments in same settings, with same reagents. And at, at some point, I find it out that oh, that was not right. So this happens quite often with a lot of PhD students in biology, that they are not able to reproduce the data. And they spend majority of their time, not even PhD researchers, spending the reproducibility of the data because their future experiments are based on that. So this is one of the problems I faced. Again, this is, we find out something interesting, 
This is a very, very common example that everybody shows in their uh, presentations. <coughs> and yeah, I find out something interesting, uh, which nobody believed, and but have uh, submitted the paper finally uh, in a very uh, high excellence journal named by pe uh, our senior peers. Uh, and I went through this path where reviewer number one was very happy, but reviewer number two was not happy which is this guy. And then again and again and again and again of several revisions, it was like my, my life was going through each and every day counting when the next review will come. And especially, it was one of the American journals, just to tell you my personal experience, they usually send email at 2 o'clock European time in the night. I wake up at 2 o'clock open my computer, check my email, whether I get reviews or not. I was doing this for two months. At some point, I told my boss, I cannot live like this. All day working in the lab, and then 2 o'clock alarm to check the reviews, whether it's there or not. And definitely, other senior peers also think that it's painful. It's really, really painful. We do science in terms of doing science, but this Peer review process is definitely not what I am looking forward to. So, beside this, finally, paper got published in a very high impact journal uh, and covered by several media. By the way, before going further, I should say uh, I did a sin that time because I don't know what open access is. So, paper got published in Science in AAAS as a first author. So, it was a big achievement as a PhD student. But uh, I'm from India, I went back home. My parents were really proud because the media covered the whole report of the, of the science in India. And my parents said, oh, we would like to see what you did. I went to internet and checked for my paper so that I can show to my parents at least the figures that how fish look like. And I was not able to access because my paper is not open access. So I was asked like this, please pay to see your paper. If you want to show it to your parents, you don't have a free copy online. And I was shocked. I, I thought about this, that why this is happening. Like, for example, a lot of students in India, or a lot of students outside Max Planck, because I am privileged by the Max Planck Society, who gave excellent condition to the researcher to do research, to have access to everything, whatever is possible. And then I saw this. This is a data from open access button. An open access button is, is something which people is looking for some papers and that they are not able to, to find the papers, then they go to the open access button, put the, put the URL of the paper, and then press the button and tell that they are not able to access. And these are like so many people outside this, this privileged zone of Max Planck. I find out that there are so many people who want to see different type of papers, want to see research, might be teachers who want to teach their students, might be somebody who have a kid or a, uh, somebody in the family who's sick with cancer, they want to read something about what's the latest features coming up. No, they cannot. Sorry. But this is coming from their money, taxpayers' money. So uh, I, 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 I said the statement. Uh, that uh, uh, my research behind the paywall is of no use, because if nobody can see it, and only few people can read it, then my motto of distributing science in the society is gone. Only selected researchers at very prestigious institutions can read my paper, and might be somebody who's interested, uh, or somebody who's sitting at home, just be curious about that, how these fish for these tribes, they cannot. And just to say that some, they asked for my photo that they want to put it, I gave it this photo, but it turns out to be this. So be careful if somebody asks your photo. <laughs> so after this, again, if you publish something, everything, you have such a bad experience, and then you go to conferences, you go to meet see, uh, several leaders of, the, of that community which, where you are doing science. So the first question there, oh, you said that, oh, I recently published a paper. Oh, that's great. Fantastic. But the first question comes, where? Which journal? 
And what's the impact factor? If it's not known in the top 10, then what's the impact factor? I was not in support of, uh, like, by chance I submit my paper there, but by chance I could have submitted to somewhere lower. And it's the same work. It's the same thing. Might be if I have published there, then people say I'm a bad scientist. This is not the way. Some areas are very CRISPR-Cas9. I hope that most of you have heard that this is a new technology of genome editing. Whatever paper comes out, it comes out really, really high these days, a new technology. But some people, some other fields like archaeology, very important. Some interesting findings. They, they are not able to made up to that high. And that doesn't mean that this is a bad research. So how you can evaluate me and my friends, other researchers who are working in, in different institutions, just on the basis of where we publish? how good we are just depending upon where we publish and what's the impact factor. An impact factor, I, I, I'm sure that I don't have to explain to all of you that what impact factor is. I usually explain to my uh, the students or early career researcher that how it is calculated because we just know the number. We don't know how the calculation is done, especially all the scientists. So you know that how it is done. And one of my colleague, Bjorn Brems, uh, he had uh, I, I, I took this slide from his presentations, and he has shown clearly that how the impact factor can be modified. There's a big example there. So uh, there is a journal from a very high known publisher. Uh, the name of the journal is Current Biology. It's a very reputed uh, journal in, in, in cell and developmental biology in my area. And they got different impact factors within a year of one time. However, there was one common thing, that was number of papers published. So number of papers published in 2001, here was 528. However, next year, when they calculate the new impact factor, because they have to calculate the paper from last year as well, the paper got reduced to 300. I don't know where those 200 papers went. So it dramatically got changed. Definitely, there are some negotiations behind it. Uh, that might be somebody sitting around and talking that might be we can, we should not consider these articles as, as the full length paper or these articles as considered in impact factor ratings because they are not matching the statistics. And definitely it's irreproducible. So if you go back, we have archives of everything. We can do our research and try to reproduce the impact factors and definitely mathematically unsound. I, I, I don't understand that how 30, 33 can predict my life, my future on the basis of that. So definitely a dissatisfaction at all the levels, especially I was, I was here and I was not very happy even after publishing very high, uh, even getting uh, good words from my, my peers and my uh, my, my mentors, they were saying, oh, fantastic, you have done a great work, and please carry on. And I was thinking, I'm in Dalma, how I will carry on like this? If nobody's going to read this, this is just going to stay somewhere on the internet like this. And definitely readers who want to read this are also not satisfied because they are not able to read the literature. And definitely the libraries, I'm not talking about Europe, I'm talking about probably outside Europe. Yeah, might be the libraries have a lot of access, depending upon... I, I was in Croatia, as I mentioned last week, and the libraries are not in situation to buy uh, journals. They are really, really poor. And they said the PhD student wants to have it. It's impossible to do your PhD without reading the literature. <coughs> However, they are doing their best. I, I have seen the librarians are doing really, really good job. They're trying their best, finding different ways how they can give uh, different possibilities to, to students, to ECR. But there is a dilemma on the level of researchers that we don't know because our career is based on these papers, these impact factors. Just finishing my PhD, whether I will get a postdoc or not, whether I will get a faculty position in future or not, just depends upon these numbers. Or those journals which are highly cited. I totally agree that there's a competition. We should, it should, there should be no competition. But this is, there is competition. 
400 people looking for one position as assistant professor. So uh, I got introduced first time to open access uh, when I joined the student union in Max Planck Society. Uh, and um, I got an opportunity to, to be a co-organizer of Berlin 11 event. Same side of, type of settings in Berlin. It was fantastic. And there I learned more about what open access is. And I, I'm just showing this definition. I'm sure that all of you know open access. But for me, I never had an idea about this thing and this thing. A lot of data which I produced, spent nights and days, I give it my license of my pictures, my data, reuse of that data to the, to the publishers. And it's coming from the taxpayers' money. And I have no idea that how many different type of licenses, how many different type of, what are copyrights regarding my papers. I have, I have never seen that before submitting the paper. So this is something which I was really enlightened at that conference. And I thought, might be this is the solution. We should educate people. And solution is open access umbrella, sharing data. Uh, if everybody is informed about that what type of different licenses there are, what, what is the copyright to the data, especially researchers, at least they will, be in, they will make a smart choice because they are not stupid, definitely. So I thought about it, what we can do within the Max Planck Society, because I'm not the only one. I, I might be the, the first one to attend this conference, but there are a lot of people in the Max Planck, roughly, roughly 4,000 PhD students in all the 80 Max Planck institutes. So how should I inform them? We, we did a survey. I want to know what, what was the condition in the Max Planck Society. Why, why people should think about open access, whether they know what open access is, just to give a ground, the ground reality of the situation. So, and this in survey was eye-opener, kind of. A lot of people say that they know, but I have some knowledge about it. They say I understand it well, just 17%. I'm not aware of it. Not that many, because I think Max Planck is a very big institution, so people hear what is going on in the, uh, on the side of publishing. And, but quite a huge amount of people who say, I have some knowledge about it. And a lot of people also say that I'm not aware about it. But I heard, but I'm, I, I'm not sure what it is. And then we ask more questions on the basis of that if what, what, is, what is your choice of selecting a journal? Why, why you select that particular journal? And why not this journal, why not that journal? And there were some interesting results. And for example, the most important was this, that the, my community where I'm doing research, my peers, my mentors, think, think. There is no, it's not written in the regulations of the university or the Max Planck that you have to publish there. They think that this is the best. So this is our thinking here. And for academic promotion, I mean, I can assume it's the same for all the early career researchers. Definitely, if, if our peers think it's the best, I would like to do something for my academic promotion, what my peers think. Definitely prestige and, and, and quality. We also think that the prestige and quality is the best what in these top, top ranking journals. Definitely other factors like impact factors and, and, and speed of publication and all those things. However, there, are, there were several other factors. In others, we ask for them if you, have, if you have any other factor which you think is interesting. Probably you can mention a comment. A lot of people say that it's not my choice. It's my supervisor who do that. And supervisor do it because he want to go ahead in his career. And I told him to do open access, but he said, you don't know anything about your career. You don't know how to make your career. I tell you how to make your career. Publish here, what I'm saying. So we came up all after analyzing everything that there is a big need of, especially in Max Planck, uh, to educate people. Uh, we, I came up with the Max Planck, with the Max Planck Digital Library and Max Planck Headquarters with altogether an idea of open access ambassador. 
So we can set up, because Max Planck is geographically distributed all over Germany, so we cannot do a conference and, in, and like say, okay, every Friday everybody's invited to a kind of open access meeting. So we did an open access ambassador program, one or two ambassador at every institute, who, whom we will train, and then they will go further and disseminate the information in the institute. And they will run the programs all over the year. Because we find it out, Max Planck Digital Library had done a lot of great things in the past. All the librarians are really working hard at various libraries at the Max Planck Institute. But it's the peers thinking, the mentors thinking. So we, we thought, I think it's best to go through this line, to go through this lane, use the peers, use the students, use the postdocs, use the uh, group leaders to educate them and probably the PhDs will, will listen more to them or hear more to them, but might be they are saying something significant. So this program uh, was started in 2014. We did a workshop um, and it was very successful. We have uh, ambassadors at each and every institute. Some institutes are not very active because uh, every section has its own demand. In physics, the archive is a fantastic system, which is in mathematics, archive is a fantastic system which is going on, but in the biology institutes or in other institutes where open access is not the humanities institutes, people are very active and want to educate everyone. <coughs> so we came up with an idea of what is going outside Max Planck. So Max Planck is probably, we can go send through emails and we can educate people what's going outside, especially in Europe. So we collaborate with uh, uh, Eurodoc, which is an association of uh, European PhD students uh, all over the Europe. We send emails and survey around and try to know what's going on in which country, how people perceive it, because in several countries it's, it's mandatory to publish to get your PhD degree. It, does, it, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're doing biology or humanities or law. So we find out that that was a distribution of that how different different people uh, took part in the survey, roughly thousand, and uh, we we came with these answers with very simple questions, not complicated, very simple questions. That have you ever heard of open access publishing? Uh, a lot of people say yes. That's that's great news. Have you ever published a scientific scientific paper? Just to note, scientific paper, and people say yes, quite majority. And this is also good news because they have to do it for their PhDs. And if yes, on previous question, please answer, have you published a scientific paper in open access? And a lot of people say no. And we want to know why, why, why they're not going towards that direction or in some other direction. So we want to ask that does your department, your peers, your people in the, in the surrounding, do they support open access? Do they give you a, a, like, it's good to publish in open access in your field? And a lot of people say, I don't know, because they're not informed about that. They never ask their peers. A lot of people say no, some people say yes. And this was the distribution account diff different, different faculties that but majority of them was, was no, that they don't know. Training, I mean to say, that copyrights, what are the licenses, what are their rights on their data. And a lot of, lot of them don't know anything, that there is such type of thing. So we asked them the last question that, do you think you will be benefited if we arrange a training for you, or a webinar or something, online, and you take it? You, you, and then a lot of people say, yes, why not? So, sorry. So we, we open an open access academy with one of, one of my colleagues, Slobodan. He, he's currently based in Italy. Uh, he established the whole open access academy online. This is a platform where we inform researchers that what type of licenses you have, which journals are available, open access in your area, what are the different possibilities. If you have less money, what are the different possibilities to obtain scholarships? to publish in that area or something like this. And a lot of other uh, webinars to inform that what, what you can do if you have a special problem. 
And then it's not students who are really worried about the system. It's the big funding agencies, Max Planck, Harvard Huge, Wellcome Trust. They think that, that the whole system is going in, in certain direction. This is monotonous. They want, and if we are, as we are changing, that the whole world is getting digitalized. The information is now available everywhere. Everybody can see what's going on in Germany. Then why not? They make things digitalized and more simple and better for the society of researchers. So a journal which is run by scientists published great research, innovative experiments, and where if my lab is not getting funds, so I should never think that I cannot publish it there because I don't have money. It should be free to publish and free to read. So the, the another interesting thing which eLife did in the very uh, in the last two or three years, they set up early career researchers, so uh, advisory group where they, they take people from all over the world and basically to get an idea what, what we want in future because we are the future of science and what, what, what we think is the right direction, what, what are the right steps which they can take in order to make it much better, whatever is possible to do for science communication. So the group especially is working on, uh, on generating different kind of webinars, uh, including uh, talking to top level scientists in, from different areas so that people got influenced and think that what if, if they are going to publish in open access, this is the right path. And definitely some travel grants. So uh, if you're published in open access or, or eLife, currently it's just for eLife. So if you publish in open access, you get travel grant to present your research because this is also important that if you attend conferences, you talk to different people that what you have done instead of telling them the impact factor. Training and support in, in peer reviews. So tomorrow, in future, I will be the professor if I really don't know how to peer review properly, the culture of peer review. And this is very, very important step which we are working on currently that to train young researchers that how to do proper peer reviewing. And definitely, if you publish in eLife, uh, highlighting you as a first author, because most of the time, the newspaper covers that uh, the lab of professor uh, XYZ uh, from University of Gottingen or University of Tübingen published this paper. So we are taking interviews for early career researchers, highlighting them with what they did, how they come up with this question, and what, did they, what, what are their future goals. Definitely, uh, I think this problem which I mentioned before, that reproducibility, which is very important for early career researchers because we spend a lot of time in order to establish our career, in order to reproduce data, to make a base. So reproducibility is a very important thing, and eLife is paying a lot of time and special project on reproducibility, especially on cancer papers, because a lot of cancer papers are not reproducible. So we are collaborating with Center of Open Science, Science Exchange, and, and working on the reproducibility. So if you reproduce any, data, any major data from the cancer papers, you can publish in eLife under this project. So this is basically give an incentive to the people who reproduce data, and those data are right, actually, to tell the other people in the society that this is reproducible. So, and I personally am a big fan of archiving, and a lot of people ask me why, why archiving your data, or why archiving the preprints or something, and especially uh, making other researchers aware uh, of your findings really fast. And these are some of the reasons, but I tell you what is the main thing here is like in physics, a lot of people see it in this way that whoever archives the first is, 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 is the person who, who came out with that idea. But in biology, that's not true. Archiving is not considered uh, as a solid fact. And a lot of people think that their data will be stolen. Like people will do the experiments again in the lab and gonna publish somewhere else in a high impact journals. But slowly, slowly, the culture is changing because several senior mentors are, are supporting this. And I, if 
some of you are there, please support your, and if early career researchers are there, please archive, pre, put preprints. It's fine to publish wherever you like, I can understand, it's very important to, to have your future career, but preprints are very important so that people can have access to your, your data. So there are several places where you can uh, put your data uh, online. These are some of the possibilities I usually tell to students. Uh, and not only this, but even more, like you can just put your data on fixed share. A uh, lot of unpublished data in the lab. Uh, you, when you leave after doing your science career for five years in that lab, a lot of things which you didn't complete, probably you can just archive or put it on fixed share so that other people will be benefited. So there are different things which you can do with pictures, definitely poster, papers, presentations, thesis. Thesis, something interesting. Thesis is very important part. It's kind of already uh, evaluated by the mentors, not one, but three, four, five mentors. And a lot of people, I, if I calculate, I do statistics that how many people publish papers, exactly all the work from their thesis. This is not even coming up to 50%. So a lot of data which is there in the thesis is still not out there. And we have to find a way to put those thesis, those data, those, that data which are in the thesis, which are not online. Uh, they are online on the library servers, but probably to, to have a bigger reach. Yeah. So uh, people start uh, doing new, new things. And this is something what I suggest to uh, different early career researchers that you can, a uh, lot of biologists start doing, like making their website, putting data on their own websites, or some uh, websites where you can share the data. And, uh, and this is recognized, like a lot of people see it. It's not that nobody's seeing it. Uh, there are several, uh, you can write a blog about your science. Might be you can inform many people about that. Uh, this is some ways to actually improve your visibility. And this is also very important. Because if you are not visible in the scientific community, no one will pay attention to you. Again, uh, some, one of a very good example that a person wrote an application for becoming an assistant professor, and he mentioned that uh, he make open access as a positive thing for his application, not uh, something very positive, that I am a big supporter of open access and scientific reputability, so I'm a strong advocate for open science, open source, open data, open access. And the use of social media and research as a way to advance research more broadly. And got the position. And with the people who were with the high impact or the people who think that they are high impact. And very good example, uh, this lady, she has done amazing job in terms of supporting open access, a big supporter of open access, uh, a kind of an, I would say, a really icon for several young uh, early career researchers that if you only support open access, still you can get position. Still you can achieve great things. So Aaron is based in Mexico, and she take a pledge that uh, I will not edit and review and work for closed access journals. I will blog my work and post preprints wherever it's possible. I will publish only in open access journals. I will not publish in cell nature science under any conditions. And she do, actually. And it's actually, it's, you have to see it from the side of early career researcher. If I take this pledge, I'm, I, I, in somewhere in my mind, I'm thinking that might be I will be not, not as competitive as of my other competitors. It's a big step. It's a very big step. And I will pull my name off a paper if co-authors refuse to be open, to make it open access. I think I personally, being a researcher, I think it's a very, very big and big dedication to open access. And currently she make it. She is appointed as a, uh, as a professor at the University of Mexico in Mexico City. And I see her as an ideal for early career researchers. So she has a website, go and read how she do and what she do and follow her. I think she's a perfect example, not only for women in science, but also for open access, early career researchers.
So altogether, we want to generate an environment where we give gold medals or positions to people who are open, who can replicate the research, who put a lot of data online so that other people can use their data to replicate the research, uh, are modest, and definitely collaborate with each other uh, and publish a good quality of papers. And for this, I request you, I'm, I'm sure that all of you know DORA, if your institution uh, haven't signed it, uh, read about it online, about DORA. Uh, it's, it's taking, on, on a very short note, it's like taking impact factors at not a major part of your evaluation system, not taking impact factors as a major part. This is simple. And it's also not written in any policy that impact factors you have to add them and, and give positions to people who have the highest. So if your institution haven't signed the DORA, please ask your institution if they, are, if they have signed DORA or not. If not, please sign it. As a, you can sign it as a person, as a researcher, as a librarian that you support DORA. So go to the website and, and please sign it. Uh, another very interesting possibility, so I'm, I'm from biology, definitely other fields, other areas, if are, you have different type of problem, uh, which you think uh, I, I'm not talking about might be very, this is very much possible. This is the platform to go. So this is OpenCon, it's a, it's a community of researchers who are supporting open access. People are coming from all over the world, and this year OpenCon will be happening in Washington, D.C. from 12th to 4th of November, 2016. And it's a fantastic place if you have a problem, go with a problem, make a project. A lot of people will join it and they will so solve it in seconds. You will feel really, really good. And the applications are open. So I, just to show that how many uh, applications we receive. So I was in the organizing committee for 2015 and 2014. And we receive, sorry, <coughs> receive applications from all over the world, all over the world. And we selected at least one person each country, so that that person can go back and teach others. And these are, so we all, and OpenCon is also doing satellite events, so if you don't get selected or if you don't have time to go to Washington, you can arrange your own event in your city. Might be libraries can arrange the, an event in the library for the students and have a li live, web, web, live telecast of OpenCon or a satellite event after the OpenCon. With this, uh, I would just like to say two things. I would really, really ask the policymakers or the senior, senior people in the universities or academic institution that it's very important to, to tell people what are their rights, what, what they, if they are producing any kind of data, what are the copyrights, what is, the, what is CC BY, what are the different licenses. So please include a small workshop in the PhD program master's program or master's program, just to inform them about this. And definitely uh, some institutional policies. This, this I'm requesting to the people who are lobbying or have access to the senior policymakers in EU and, and US. Please ask institutions or make policies where a special credit is given to the person who have published an open access journal or they have made their paper open access, at least. With this, I would like to say thanks to Max Planck Society and eLife uh, for supporting me for all the work which I have done uh, informing researchers and disseminating the information regarding open access. Thank you for listening. So thank you very much, although you, you gave it from an early stage researcher, and I'm sure it affects all of us, and uh, you're very brave to suggest the steps we need to take to be less competitive, but uh, see if we can advocate for that. So before I go on and ask questions, I'll open to the audience. Would uh, anybody like to ask any questions? So I'll start with one then. Yeah, sure. Um, so you gave us a, a pledge that we can do for open access to make it sort of 
you know, I will never submit to nature, and I promise. And, um, but then, you know, a few slides before, you said, okay, then an assistant professorship opens up and 400 people apply, right? So there's this competition versus uh, reward. I, so do I, you know any action? I mean, you, you gave a success case of New Mexico and, and, and that, but I mean, is that an isolated incident? Or is this something can become mainstream? And I know that if we all work together, it will work, but... Exactly. Uh, will we work together, do you think? Yeah, so I try to, when, wherever I go, whichever university, or if I meet to a policymaker, um, for example, in ERC or, or somewhere uh, in DFG, or I, I ask them that how you evaluate projects. So, for example, I was working in Croatia with some policymakers. I asked them how we evaluate these projects, whether this is an excellent science or not. And it's definitely nowhere, no policy rights that count impact factors. Nobody says that. <laughs> might be some places, but we have to generate this thinking with, with meeting with the peers, uh, informing your, a uh, lot of professors say, uh, might be you have a meeting with your peers and tell them that what are the benefits of open access. You will even get more citations. So you can use citation index or something. Uh, you can, uh, some of the examples which I show that you can get visible in the, in the community. But I'm, I'm showing you that if you get yourself visible in the community, it's possible. It's definitely a hard step. I'm, I'm telling that I haven't done this, but Erin has done that, so she's a better example than me. I start publishing in open access journals, but I, 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 I am not fulfilling the pledge of public, not publishing in nature itself. Nature also have open access journals, nature communications, and other high journals which are open access. So the main thing is to publish open access, and definitely not use impact factors in your application. <laughs> Uh, hello. Actually, uh, I have uh, a question for both of uh, uh, this morning's uh, uh, speakers. Uh, there, we are living in, in, in an age where we have a deluge of, of, of information, papers, 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 more and more papers. Uh, I fully agree, uh, and uh, I think uh, there is a kind of competition. We are all competing uh, for uh, uh, the attention of our peers. Okay. We want our papers to be read. And in such kind of data deluge, what uh, tools do you see uh, that could help uh, researchers to find uh, uh, the paper uh, uh, they need to, to read. I completely agree mm -hmm. that impact factor is not the good tool, but we have to find something exactly. else. So do you want to answer? Sure. So I, I personally think as an early career researcher, uh, the, in this digital age where everybody can read what's going on in the internet, uh, use internet as a, a lot of researchers uh, don't use, don't blog, don't write anything, but probably write uh, five uh, lines, uh, basic lines about your um, your project, like, uh, and it's I think it's a very good training also to say five lines about your whole project. To write those small blogs, uh, make yourself visible in the community, and this can be done by going to the uh, different conferences, making your online presence, do tweets. Uh, a lot of people uh, tweet about their results, especially Aaron. <laughs> that what's going on and where she submitted the paper, where people can read the paper. It's in the preprints or something. So I think the most important thing is like, like your online, uh, how much you are known in the, in the society in general. And there are certain channels which you can use. But people don't trust that those channels are really valuable enough to get a position. And I am showing you some of the examples that they are. Thank you, incidentally, for a really marvelous conference. I really enjoyed it. But to respond to your question, you're right. I mean, we're com you said competing for the attention of others. But we're not uh, competing for the attention of everybody. It's only a certain number of people that we, we are uh, uh, potentially, people we may not know about, by the way. 
with that we are trying to, to, to gain their attention. And there I think there is again a role for the librarians. Imagine a system in, in libraries where the librarian would, as soon as a paper is, is published, would do some um, algorithmically organized text mining and data mining in order to relate that to existing texts which have been already data mined, and et cetera, to nourish the local conversation inside the university, the regional conversation, the national conversation, the continental conversation, the world conversation, and sending every time the information back to the author or authors of a particular paper saying, these are the paper that might be of interest to you in terms of potential readers of your work. Why don't you attract their attention now if you think some of them are really interesting? And that, that doesn't play uh, with a, a regime of competition. It's rather a regime of selection of, uh, I would say, focused attention from people that could also, again, create new communities and new networks and new, uh, new forms of, of, of distributed intelligence. I think if we start thinking of ourselves in those ways, uh, the game, to call it a game, becomes a lot more positive, richer, and you can have the wonderful smile of this young man who is obviously has that sort of quality in himself, and I really admire that. Thank you very much for that uh, talk, and as always, a little gratitude for coming and giving that interesting talk for us. Thank you. Thank you.